but it's Wednesday, and on Wednesday we do it for a community. And one thing we know for sure, crime and violence is definitely surging in Jamaica around the world, if we're going to be honest about it. But last time I checked, the numbers are at 112 murders. We haven't even been through a full month. That's almost four murders a day. You understand? This isn't even just natural causes. This is not accidental death. These are murders. And imagine how many more we don't even know about. Unsolved mysteries, missing people. So it's a real problem out there in the streets right now. We need to figure out how we as a community, as well as how we can hold the people in power accountable for what's going on. So we've invited special guest, Senator Pizza Bunting, to come hang out with us today. So, um, Senator Bunting. Hi, good afternoon to you and to your listeners. Welcome to the show. Welcome. We appreciate you hanging out with the madness here on The Crossover. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, talking about what's going on in Jamaica, you have lived here for quite some time. Not to call you old because we're probably around the same age. I'm just saying. But have you (laughs) seen it this bad? Uh, Well, at the rate we started off the year, if we continue, it would be the worst ever year. I mean, in fact, when you have the statistics up to January 22nd, Yeah showed 111 murders. That's for 22 days. So that's more than five murders per day. If that pace or that rate was continued for the entire year, this would definitely be our worst year. However, I caution that, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, we this will be a, a spike that will be brought under control uh, shortly. Absolutely. Although, also sort of you said it you, you said it would be. That means it's not. So it's been close to this bad, this bad already. How how was it remedied then? What happened then? Well, the police have to to adjust their their targets. They have to um, follow a, a sort of data driven approach. They have to look where where the hot spots are and saturate them with police and soldiers, they have to uh, identify the, you know, the violence producers and target them, you know, based on intelligence. And usually, if that is sustained, um, some respite comes from the, the violence. And, you know, what is very interesting, if you look at Jamaica with a geographic area of over 4,400 square miles. If you take a tiny area like the, the parish of Kingston is, is eight square miles. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you take that police area and add Southern St. Andrew, um, you know, which may be around the same side, the South St. Andrew Police Division, that tiny area, less than 1% of Jamaica's geographic area, produces about a third of all our murders and shootings. How many officers do we have legitly? I mean, functional officers in the streets of Jamaica, approximately. We have, the last thing I saw was a little under 12,000, which is one of the issues because we we have an established and approved force strength of 14,000. So we're substantially below the the level that's approved and it's, um, and the police commissioner estimated he really needs about 18,000 to effectively, uh, you know, put a dent into into the crime figures. So what this else? is one of the things we've been making a point that, you know, a lot of money is being spent, but it's not being spent efficiently or effectively because this would have been a, a high yield area if they'd use this to recruit a lot more police officers. Yeah, but you can recruit a bunch of officers, but is the training up to par to, to actually deal with the heavy weight of the problems that are going on? I mean, we still seem to have a disconnect when it comes to the public being able to commute with the officers or, or feeling safe or comfortable, you know, telling the officers certain times when crimes are committed. There's still this 
disconnect not saying all is bad and not blaming either side but there's a major disconnect and also with the way things are handled it's almost as if it appears to be a lot of shoot first ask questions later regardless of civilians are around or not so i mean yes increase the officers but what about changing up how the training is done well i think some uh progress has been made in improving the professionalism of the force um over the years the, but there definitely is has been a traditional long-standing trust issue between citizens and the police and uh, that needs to be addressed the the other thing is that if you want to attract and retain um better qualified uh better caliber police officers you need to compensate them Oh, amen. You know, and and <laughs> Glad been, you said it. You know, yes. the police officers are not well compensated in Jamaica, and they, they have been treated... So what's the with, incentive? What's the in Aside from being able to have the power to possibly, allegedly, seemingly do a few corrupt things to put extra money in your pocket, what's my incentive to being an officer? Like, legitly, I'm asking this as a legit question. What would my well, incentive I think, be? I think... The, I think many people really want to make a contribution, and they, they recognize that violent crime is one of the things holding back the country, and mm -hmm. I think many join with the intention of making a contribution in that regard. But we have a very high attrition rate because the ones who are not corrupt, you know, not getting kickbacks on the side, yep. they find it hard to maintain their families mm -hmm. on their official pay. Yep. And what often happens is that those better ones who sometimes are trained in, in specialized areas, they're attracted to go and work overseas in Cayman, in, you know, other course, Caribbean islands, benefits. in North America, in Canada or, or, or the United States. Mm -hmm. So this, this is a problem. If you, if you want a professional police force, you have to compensate them well. Absolutely. Yeah, and let them feel pride. I don't even see any kind of like sovereigns or anything when there is a police that died in the line of duty. It's like you read a police died in the line of duty. But then where where is the sovereignty with the officer? All these things matter. But right now we're talking about the murders. We'll get back to the police because there's so many different elements that that really involves and pushes crime. So I want to talk about the politics, the, the politicians that are in power. I mean, if you look at places where there are low crime rates, there are quite a few things that they have in common. Like, for instance, there's a strong sense of community where different communities in that environment can reach out to their politicians for what their community needs, and, and they're able to care for themselves. There are community centers. There are real connections between the public and the people in power, so they're able to get what they need. So there is seemingly less crime in those places. I mean, how is it that we're not adapting a lot of these actions to let people be more self-sustainable so that they're less angry and they're less likely to go along with what's going on? When, when I was Minister of National Security between 2012 and 2015, that's precisely the route that we took. We, we brought in some initiatives. For example, we decriminalized possession of ganja, personal use. Mm. And that Thank you. reduced the friction between the youth in these communities mm -hmm. and the police. Um, 14,000 fewer arrests per year were made, giving these young men criminal records, yeah. preventing them from getting a visa preventing them from overseas work programs, yes. preventing them from getting a job in yep. many public and private sector You know how many of them got a stigma? Stig just the simplest exactly. thing as a stigma, just because they were smoking weed and now an officer put them in handcuffs. So now they're exactly. just a bad criminal person for smoking a split. Exactly. And, and basically what you were doing with that was pushing them into the arms yes. of the gang because they, that they are the only ones that didn't discriminate against employing them with a criminal record. Exactly. Um, so we did things like that. We, we sort of demilitarized the policing. In these inner city communities, they often only see policing, uh, police with ballistic, um, you know, helmets, you know, body armor, M16 assault rifles. That's their experience of policing. And we 
made a strong effort to put the police back into civilian clothes, into the car key and the red Yeah, man, key. you need the civilian and officers on, on, on the road. I don't know, even understand why who, that's not exactly, a thing. Exactly, who would focus on community policing right. rather than this, you know, heavy-handed, militarized-type policing. And we made progress. We formed, we started an initiative called Unite for Change, which recognized yeah. that you needed a partnership with civil society, with the churches, with yes, the, community the community groups. You know, we started um, positive uh, behavior or interventions in schools, you know, school-wide um, positive behavioral intervention supports. So we realized why did that it fall apart? What happened? Where is it? Because, well, the new administration came in and they took the view that social interventions don't work. You know, which was really... <laughs> wait, 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 wait. You can literally Google it and see statistics on how it works. Are you really seriously trying to tell me that that's the reason they gave? That is the, the Minister of National Security, Harris Chan, um, made that statement that social interventions don't work. And, and so they have... Made so in other words, in other words, can I say this? You can't say it. So in other words, allegedly, that was a part of the budget they found expendable. So let's just, hey, not that important. Exactly. You know, unless you know, <laughs> yeah, and so so okay. So and then, um, and then and then they've diverted that money not to regular policing, but they've diverted it to the military. So they've been building up the size of the military as if what we need is an occupying force in this country, you know, like, you know, uh, Afghanistan or Iraq or something when it was, you know, when you see the military in their home bees patrolling the, the areas. That, that's not what we need in our no, country. All, like of that, all of that is show off stuff. And all of that is yeah. you spending money with friends of yours on stuff that we do not need right now. So I'm confused about it. But hey, nobody wants to listen to little old Nikki over so, here. Now, I got a question because we can't stay on the phone all day. I would talk to you forever because I got a million questions. Trust me. But um, the person in charge of security right now, Minister Cheng, is in charge of security right now, and nothing is happening, and people are calling for his job. And in my mind, I'm thinking, if I work a nine-to-five and everything is going down to pooter on my shift all the time and there doesn't seem to be anything in action, I'm not able to keep my job. So as a taxpayer, I'm curious as to why my taxpayer is going to someone who is not actually putting forth action, and why is that so hard to digest? Why, why, why is this even a question right now? Like, talk to me straight. Why is this? Why is this here? Why, why? <laughs> well, I don't. You know, we talk about accountability for leadership, but if you exactly as you said, you know, if you were in the private sector, holding a senior job as, you know, CEO, um, or vice president of sales they and year be. after year after year you know your performance got worse you couldn't keep that job if my employees you know, started are... dropping dead and people getting <laughs> sick and asbestos is coming out the thing and i don't fix the asbestos and more people dying i ain't gonna have a job so how how and if you were in that seat right now what will be the top three things i need to know that you think will be the first because I mean, there is no bulletproof way to fix this, especially when it, we can just try to band-aid it as much as possible and let it start to heal. So what will be the top three things you would do to start band-aiding what's going on with this just fallout of murders and crimes that's happening? Well, the first thing, and, you know, we always say this is medium to long term, so we postpone ever doing it. But if we had started doing it years ago, um, we would be well along now. And that is investing in our disadvantaged community. Amen. As I said earlier, it is it is the communities that have the failing schools, yep. the community with poor housing infrastructure, mm -hmm. you know, where garbage is not regularly collected, where oh, sewage absolutely. is running in the streets. These are the same communities that are producing much of the violent crime. Until we recognize that we have to invest in our people in these communities, then, you know, we're going to um, be lulled into, into this perpetual thing of, of suppressing them. 
you know, sending more and more soldiers and police and stuff. So long term, the most important thing we can do is invest in those young people um, in these and in these disadvantaged communities yep. to change the environment that they're living and operating in. That's that's one. The second thing we can be more effective in our in our policing interventions and in our crime control interventions mm. by, for example, training and deploying violence interrupters. During my time when we saw much better results, we had 130 trained violence interrupters. These were people from the community who we trained to intervene and break the cycle of reprisal and counter-reprisal. So you'd have one issue of violence. Yeah, somebody from their own community. That's a brilliant. Exactly. That's brilliant. But exactly. once again, what was it? Too much money, too much funding to do that. It yeah. costs. It costs you know, too much to save people. It, 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 you know, it's like that old saying: if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. You know. Well, they did. They are trying ignorance. That's why they charge so much for education. So, so hard for people to get. And now they have what they have. And now, oh, you know what? We can go on forever. But what you just said to me is the most important thing. And the government needs to be more proactive with the communities. Like, for instance, give initiatives for all these different communities to have community cleanups. Make it fun. Provide maybe food provided by. You're the government. You can team up with five million corporations to help sponsor this in so once a community know hey we got some free chicken from pan chicken over here sponsored by the government to clean up community you know you put out initiatives to say each community member one member from the community can get a scholarship if they prove that they've done something great for their community the greater thing you've done you can get this scholarship from this college there are so many things that won't cost the government that much money so they can do what they want to do with the money that they should be using for us <laughs> there's so many things it just seems like it's laziness why it's not happening. And then just blame the poor people as if it's just all their fault. Absolutely. And it, it, it's a mindset, you know, it's a mindset. When it's an, an us versus them, when, when you are defending the position of the elite, because the elite often are who matter to, to some politicians, because they're the ones that are going to finance their campaigns. And so they pander to them rather than... Uh, uh, take a more balanced approach. Yeah. And, and yeah. my position has always been that, look, I went into politics to try and help those who didn't have a voice, who didn't have the access that, that I have, who may not have the platform that I have, and, and help to improve their quality of life. Yep. And that is the only long-term sustainable way to Absolutely. break out of the cycle of poverty and, and violence. Absolutely. Absolutely. I fully agree. Thank you so much for your time. It was actually quite nice talking to you. I don't really like talking politics, but it was nice talking to you, sir. All right. Thank you very much. Same here. All right. We'll talk again soon. Until next time, it's Community Wednesday.